Okay. Um, can you speak on uh, an artist that came around later named Doobie? <laughs> Doobie. What make you think about Doobie? Yeah, of all artists. I know I tapped at him a little bit, so hopefully maybe that's why. I heard he have been reaching out to some people. I want to do an interview. I want to do an interview. I don't know what you can say, Doobie. I mean, okay, Doobie, you want some attention. I'll give you some attention. I'll give you some reasons for people to reach out to you. The song that you got on Death Row, Doobie, don't you remember who really gave you that song, Doobie? Who did I have you rewrap word for word, Doobie, the song from? Do you remember a name, Chocolate Bandit Doobie? Your song, Country, you didn't write Doobie. I gave that to you. That was Chocolate Bandit song, Doobie. Doobie, let me remind you of something. <laughs> On the road trip, I would let them wait until you got close to your hometown before I let them do what to you, dude. Don't you remember when I had those niggas take that death row chain from you and send you home, Doobie, and your mama and daddy calling the realists and stuff, asking them why they doing this to my son and all that, Doobie? You forget about that dude. Dude. You want me to tell what Sally B did to you, Doobie? Really? Keep talking, Doobie. I'll make you famous. Remember Tupac words? You want to be famous? I'll make you famous. That's all I got to say about Doobie. Okay. What about the Rillas? The Rillas? The Rillas is my, at one time, I looked at him as my little brother. Uh, we haven't been that close, that close lately, but the Rillas is somebody that calls, nigga, what you doing? How you doing? Every week. If I don't talk to the Rillas at least twice a week, something's wrong. But we're going to save a lot of the stories for the Rillas because the Rillas are going to be coming doing the show, him and Big C style with us pretty soon, sometime during this month. Yeah. The realists are solid, though. The realists is the reasoning that a lot of people got brought on, to be honest. The majority of the people that was on the road came from the realists' recommendation and going up, talking to Shug personally himself and convincing Shug to give them a shot. And so the realists helped out a lot of them. The realists got a bad rap for... Um, the Tupac sound alike and stuff like that. But that's what attracted us to him. And he probably wouldn't have got a deal with us if he didn't have that unique sound that he had. It's unfortunate we played into it a little bit too much and messed up his career, which he still has a, a he's doing great for himself, uh, him and his wife. But um, I think he, it's more talented than any, or just as talented as any of the artists that we know today that did become very successful. And I, I blame myself and Shug for him not uh, being able to succeed as far as he did. I remember from a dude from the Bay, uh, the Big Braves and Wiggins, he had like $700,000 one time. And this is when me and a guy was messing with the realists from True Dad Entertainment, my boy Bob Gotti. And he was like, man, I got $700,000 to invest in the realists right now. And I, this is like 2006 or seven. And I really wish that I would have convinced the realists to take that deal and still look on with this guy that I did with, uh, you know, called True Dad Entertainment. Who y'all got the song uh, uh, "Peeping Game" with Ray J from, and uh, Airy Now and Then, because Airy Now and Then is really the artist that uh, the Rillas should have been or could have been produced by Damon Thomas. Yeah. Okay. What about um, any stories with the Outlaws? The Outlaws. Mutal coming to do a show with us real soon, if it's not already already running with us. But um, 
Whew. Um, I'm not one to say that I was with them like every day and all of that. The only time I really saw them was at the studios or the shows or video shoots and stuff like that. Uh, you know, during the park days, the, the heyday. Um, but I knew, you know, we always was doing something and being together. But they were young, uh, wild. They were park little soldiers. You know, even though he was only like four or five years older than them, they really looked up to Park and, well, you know, Muta was a little, little bit younger. But they really all looked up to him and respected his game and, and his knowledge and what he was putting out there. And I'm not saying, speaking, when I call the outlaws, I'm not putting that, that jacket on Bogart or Big Sight because they were older and um, they they kind of had Park back, uh, you know, with the Crip side uh, when he was hanging out here in L.A., pre-death row. And so I was never try to make them that type of outlaw when I was talking about the outlaw. I was speaking of the, the four or the five, meaning Noble, Castro, Edie, and Yak, and Moo is the ones I was speaking of. But there's some other people that consider themselves as outlaws, like Storm, uh, my boy Wack Deuce, I believe, and uh, my boy Nutsos from up north that was going to be signed on Hammer's label, which is Keisha Cole's little younger brother, or older brother, as a matter of fact. That's her older brother. So, yeah, um, I know them to call themselves outlaws as well. And so, but yeah, outlaws was all solid. All cool. They were nasty as fuck. <laughs> I remember uh, when it was, you know, after the album was over, this landlord called us, we had him in this house, it was probably worth about a couple of million dollars even back then. And he called in there crying. Like, would y'all please come to see my house? It got dog shit all over it. <laughs> Man, it cost us about thirty six to forty thousand dollars to get that house back restored, right? But other than that, the outlaws was one hundred. Do you have any stories or any um experience with Keisha Cole back in the day when she was around the label when she was super young? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keisha was around. I remember her coming around first at the Mother's Day and she came and performed at the Mother's Day event. Her and another young lady because uh, they were Nutso's little sister who Hammer was big on. Uh, he had a, strike, a song called Street Life that they, they really liked and um uh, uh, Hammer was going, going to be one of Hammer's first act that he was going to sign on Hammer Time Records and Keisha and her sister was around and they were cool and um, but she didn't come back around because uh, she was just at that Mother's Day event and around a little bit around that time but I don't remember Keisha coming back around until like 2018 I'm sorry no not 2018 2000 and one, the later part of 2001, when she came home, she she came out. He took her to Hawaii. Uh, that's when her and Ray J hooked up out there, and you know, um, and you know, in Hawaii, and um, she was around for a little bit after that. Other than that, where everybody feels she had all this power connected, I don't I don't know when it happened. I don't get the timeline. I don't understand it, but she was around a little bit, like I said, in 2001 and around a little bit, um, you know, prior to Park, Park Dell, from the Mother's Day event to about Park's Dell. A lot of people don't realize or don't know a lot of people were going out. And that night when Park and them got shot, everybody was out there, the meaning Shug's daughter, Shug's parents, uncles, and everything. Why? Why were they all out there, y'all? For y'all that don't remember, I'm not talking to the the people. I'm talking about to the people that um, was among us. They were all out there because we was having a big uh, a picnic or like a family reunion or something at Lake at, at Lake Mead, uh, where we was gonna go riding the jet skis and. In the boat and all of that 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 Sunday, 
And that's why she'll get a lot of the young people coming out there and coming around. So yeah.